At Five Star Bank, community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. Today, no Republican holds statewide office. And recently, Democrats held two-thirds majorities in both houses of the legislature. Are California Republicans an endangered species? What happened to the party of Ronald Reagan and Earl Warren, who not only dominated California politics, but went on to national prominence? What's next for the party? And what are the implications if California remains essentially a one-party state? Joining us today on Studio Sacramento, our Yolo County Supervisor and Redistricting Strategist, Matt Rexroad, and Political Consultant, Rob Stutzman. Gentlemen, given the current state of Republicans holding office, Matt, does the patient have a pulse? Uh, the patient surely, surely has a pulse in California. Um, I think that California needs a strong Republican Party, and it needs to become stronger without a doubt. But um, good public policy indicates that there has to be a pushback, and the Republicans need to argue for those principles that they hold dear. And uh, I think that good California government depends upon that voice being strong. Rob, how did we get here? Well, we got here largely through demographic shifts in, in California and a Republican Party that in its history, ironically, since we are the party that issued the Emancipation Proclamation, has therefore then struggled, particularly with emerging minority and immigrant communities throughout its history. So that's an element of this as our demographics have changed, but California's decline in Republican Party statewide is largely, I think, due to demographic shifts. And not, and not like Prop 187 and Pete Wilson? No, I'm not going to blame Because that, that tends blame to be the national people. sort of... But, well, I identified there has been a problem with being able to relate and reach out to immigrant communities, which in California obviously is largely Hispanic. 187 ended up leaving a residual scar. There's, there's no question about that. But that's also quite a ways in the rearview mirror. Sure. And sure. you're into second generation now uh, with a lot, of, a lot of those communities from the days of 187. Who probably wouldn't even remember Prop 187. Well, they just, right? they, they've, they've heard it talked about, mm -hmm. you know, and they've heard certain people still demonized. Um, I think Pete Wilson did what any politician of any party would have done at the time, which is capitalize on an issue that passed overwhelmingly in order to secure their own reelection. So I don't think it's fair to demonize Pete Wilson. Well, one thing that's interesting I want to point out as we start this discussion, though, is there are super majorities of Democrats in the state legislature in the congressional delegation that control all the statewide offices, but a majority of local officials in California are Republican. Really? It's this really? is really absolutely true. Yes. So Republicans are <clears throat> being involved in local government. And it's there that you see Republicans have to focus on actually governing and delivering local services, mm -hmm. like Matt as a county supervisor has to do. So when I if I am optimistic about anything, it is that Republicans and Republican principles have manifested themselves at the local level. And when you strip away party labels, because local government's nonpartisan races, when you take away the party labels and people are just talking about Republican principles at the local level, they're getting elected, even Democrat-controlled cities and counties. This is fascinating. I've never heard that before. Well, there's a, c a couple of reasons for that. There, there is the, um, there's the basis of, well, LA County has five supervisors, right? And, well, so does Shasta County. So, you know, you tend to balance those out. You know, a lot of these supervisors who represent very small populations, there's supervisors in Modoc County who get, a, get fewer votes for supervisor than the student body president at Pleasant Grove High School. And so <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a very different um, way to judge that. But you do have a lot of cities that are smaller where you do have Republicans who do get elected to local office just based on the principles of the party by running efficiently. If I'm critical of one thing of our party nationally, it has been for those issues that we disagree on, that we lose on, uh, we tend to be sore losers and we just vote no forever. In the end, I think Republicans have a responsibility to step up and make sure that things like the Affordable Care Act and others are administered properly. There's a role for the Republicans to push back and argue for fiscal responsibility and those principles being part of the administration of any program that the government does. So 
three years ago, mm -hmm. you joined us to talk about redistricting mm -hmm. in California. And redistricting, the new redistricting that we're all living under now, mm -hmm. uh, how has it worked in, in terms of how you thought it would work back when you f we were first discussing this? Well, when we first discussed it, we were only to talking about redistricting within the state of California. And at the time, it was basically as a result of the gerrymander that happened in 2001. 20 years of demographic changes were all coming upon California in one election, and that was in the 2012 election. We're about to experience our second time here. And so I'm not, very, I'm not really surprised. Uh, the other thing that uh, changed this election cycle this past time, it was the first year after redistricting, first election after redistricting, and we had a presidential election. The turnout was overwhelmingly in support of President Obama. Back four years ago when he ran against Senator McCain, we assumed that um, this was a high watermark that, that President Obama couldn't possibly do this, that it was a fluke, a tidal wave of support. But the reality is he won California by almost the same percentage uh, margin that he did four years earlier. I think the water is here to stay in terms of California the way they do that. But interesting you talk about redistricting. Redistricting is also one of the key reasons that Republicans r really have very little threat of losing the House of Representatives in the next decade. Uh, we can talk about how Republicans aren't doing well in California, but they're very likely to hold the House and the United States Senate after this next election. And that's because largely in the House, it's, it's Republicans have benefited by redistricting across the country. And so why people want to say that Republicans, you ask whether they have a pulse or not, well, they're probably going to control two, ho two of the three, um, or one of the branches of government, two, both houses at the federal level, and they're going to be playing a role long term. And I don't think it's impossible to think that a Republican could be the next president of the United States. It, it is somewhat improbable that a Republican would be the next governor of California. Rob, how do you react, though, to the fact that it, given Rex's point of view, and for federal politics, why there's such a disconnect here in California, and, and how do you all go about fixing that? Well, it's, you know, the federal politics is largely what defines uh, the brands of politics, both for both parties. And so when you look at the, the problem of the Republican Party in California, <clears throat> our brand problem largely exists outside the borders of the state, okay? So when you see a Republican primary process for president, which gives you a dozen uh, debates with a bunch of candidates trying to outright wing each other before the Iowa caucuses, it does not help with our definition out here in California where we need to expand our base. California's last uptick in Republican voter registration was when George W. Bush was president in his first term in the days after 9-11, okay? They reacted to his strong leadership and Republican registration actually ticked up in California. So I do believe that we are somewhat um, slave to the whims of what happens with national brands. So I am optimistic that a good Republican candidate for president, uh, which will start to manifest itself in just over a year when the campaign starts getting in the, in the full swing, is part of what has to happen out here in terms of, of changing the brand. That's the number one fundamental thing. Then after that, we need to be embracing policies that are appropriate for California and expand our political base. I think of someone like Congressman Jeff Denham, who is in his district willing to say, we need immigration reform. There needs to be some path to permanency here for, for people that are a big part of our economy, while we also still secure the border. What, what is it, though, what's going on in the Republican Party that, that tends to generate this level of sort of civil war that takes place? Uh, for instance, um, in, uh, in Mississippi, there was a recent election, uh, or a primary election for United States Senate. But all across the country, it seems that there's this uh, war between what's called the establishment and right. uh, the more grassroots folks. What is that all about? Well, there is some struggle within the, I mean, the Republican Party under Reagan, at its peak, if you will, right, was able to unite um, fiscal conservative, social moderates, country club type Republicans with more of your very conservative middle class, um, socially conservative Republicans. We united over this thing called the Cold War, okay? In the era of the last couple decades without a Cold War, the Republican Party has struggled at times. We had a war on terror uh, that I think, you know, supplemented that for a while, but we still have these fundamental issues that are largely economic issues and the idea about what government but should it, be. But isn't it true, though, you talk about Ronald Reagan and the Cold War and uniting everybody, but gentlemen, 
Ronald Reagan probably would not survive the Republican primaries because they'd consider him a rhino, a Republican in name only. Well, that's especially on the issue of immigration. Isn't that true? Yeah. Well, actually, one of my largest frustrations when I hear people bring up Ronald Reagan, they talk about the party of Reagan and whatever else. Um, Ronald Reagan's record has been grossly distorted over the over the decades. It's been he was a very um, a very um, good manager of state government when he was the governor of California. And um, he set that record up to be able to be elected president because he managed things appropriately. Um, but, but Rob made a point here earlier that I want to touch on that's important. Um, nationally, pe people say all the time, I want to change the brand of the California Republican Party. There's not enough money in the world to be able to do that when, they're, when the, there's this constant drumbeat on 24-hour news shows coming out of Washington, D.C. that's setting the brand of the Republican Party. We can't, there, we're not going to be able to do a one-off and change that. We are going to live with this broadcast that's coming out of Washington, D.C. regarding the Republican Party. And if you're the Republican leaders in Washington, D.C., are you willing to change the party in such a way and, and, f and sacrifice all of those red flyover states and the South in order to take a chance of maybe being able to be competitive in California when you control the House of Representatives are likely to control the U.S. Senate and have a chance of electing a president but, of the United States. You're but, not going to do that. But, but that being said, there, there are those who say that what is happening in California is going to happen to those other flyover states. As an example, is Texas big, big giant state and one, frankly, that, that tends to frustrate many of us because of them taking away California jobs all the time. Is there, the Republicans dominate their state's politics the way that Democrats do in California? Is, is Texas the future of California or is California the future of Texas? Texas should learn to what happened in, to California in terms of the demographic changes and the Republicans there should get on the front wave of that and being able to address those issues before it comes home to change um, the state of Texas like it did the state of California. Um, there's no doubt about that. But the other point of this is, is that people want to, I have very few candidates who say, hey, vote for me because I'm a Republican. They say vote for me because some of other some other issue that, that defines them or because of their ability to be able to lead. In California, unfortunately, we've also had a problem with our last statewide office holder, Governor Schwarzenegger, left office in not a good spot. His, his administration was not considered to be well run. Well, wasn't he also yeah, considered to be now. a, wasn't he also considered to be a rhino, a Republican in name only though? Yeah as well? well? Well, he was, but there's other character issues that were involved in that in terms of administration, looking back on them. You don't see anyone saying, it, you see people running on the, on the mantle of Ronald Reagan. You even see people embracing Governor Wilson, bringing him into certain places. You don't see anyone saying, hey, I've got the endorsement of Arnold Schwarzenegger. I mean, that just doesn't happen. <laughs> no, there's no Democrat or Republican wants that. Well, and Schwarzenegger arguably never would have been elected through a, a normal process because he would have had trouble getting through a Republican primary 12 years ago. It was the special election of the recall that gave this unique opportunity to basically have an open election one time to get him, to get him elected. So <clears throat> arguably we have not had, you know, since 1994, real statewide success. I mean, we're about 20 years out. But, but didn't many people argue that Schwarzenegger's brand of republicanism was what sold in California and that the party needed to be more like him. And, and, but essentially what both of you gentlemen are saying is, is that in fact, he was an anomaly that really has no resonance well, whatsoever. You have, you have a general election problem versus a primary problem, right? One of the problems Matt talked about the gerrymander. Well, why that was bad for Republicans in the last decade is there's <clears throat> the assembly Republican caucus would get together and they're all looking at each other because their, co their competition for the next Senate seat is in the room. So the pressure was to outright wing each other to win a primary for a safe Republican Senate seat. And it drove politics to the right. Really? This happened until this year when we had an open primary. It happened as, as early as four years ago when po Steve Poisoner demagogues on the immigration issue in a closed Republican primary, forcing Meg Whitman to the right and making it very difficult to recover from that for the general election. So our primary politics where you have basically the same two, 2.3 million Republican voters, I know that sounds like a lot, but it's not in the scheme of California, having all this influence on who Republicans would put forward for statewide office. In the era of open primary, we'll see if that changes or not. To date, after two cycles of open primary, the June, these primaries pretty much function like closed primaries, only really hardcore partisans have been turning out. But I think there is some opportunity in the future 
if those turnout dynamics change, that you know, Republican candidates will not be constrained to this internal conversation um, when it comes to the June primaries, and hopefully we can elect people that have broader appeal, mon nominate people that have broader Incidentally, appeal. Incidentally, you were an advisor to Meg Whitman Correct. in her run for governor. Uh, one of the interesting things that I've heard recently, grumbling among Democrats, is that <clears throat> Jerry Brown is a far more conservative governor and has gotten away <laughs> with more in gouging traditional Democratic interests than Meg Whitman ever could have and that he's governed to her right. Governor Brown is doing the best impersonation of Ronald Reagan than anyone else in the Capitol building right now. He's governing in a common sense way. He's holding the Democrats' feet to the fire in terms of spending and he's, he is, even though he has raised taxes like Governor Reagan did, he's pushing back on excessive spending right now. Gray Davis went through the same thing, frankly, after he was elected 98 in his first term. I mean, the only people you could find willing to criticize Gray Davis in the press in the first two years in office was John Burton, then the leader of the Senate. <laughs> oh, really? I mean, there is just a classic executive versus legislative branch tension. And at the end of the day, the executive, the governor, needs to be the adult in the room, especially when it comes to spending. And, and Brown has, has done exactly that. He's been the, the adult in the room, the backstop, whatever you want to call it. So should we look forward to Jerry Brown uh, this year's California Republican Party Man of the Year? <laughs> no, uh, we shouldn't. Be, but the important part that the Republican Party needs to do is on the implementation of AB 109, on the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, um, somebody AB needs, 109. That's AB 109 is the is the the, the realignment of, of the prison population in California and how we treat state prisons, which I would argue has been malpractice over 20, 30, 40 years of of the state of state government not dealing with these issues, um, is finally come home and the and basically cost issues are driving these and the, and the and the federal mandate to be able to change these. Republicans should be pushing back on Governor Brown, saying you're implementing these things in an inappropriate way. You're forcing these criminals out on the street. You need to own this. And right now, nobody's doing that. The, um, the Republican Party, as it, it, as it moves forward, both this year and in the future, there are a, a couple of signs that on a statewide level, things are coming back. Now, in some of the statewide races, there's at least a Republican in the mix. Kevin Faulkner recently won mayor of San Diego. In a special election. In a special election. What, what are those candidates doing right? And are there any trends that you see coming out of those races? Well, I mean, with Faulkner, it goes back to what we were saying about local government. I mean, even though there was a partisan veneer to that race in San Diego, there's still a sense of local governing issues not being hardcore partisan issues. And so Faulkner comes off the council presenting himself as the more competent manager in a real contrast to the mayor that just had to resign. Yeah, because Kevin's pretty understated, quiet, mild guy. I think San Diego was, was ready for that. Voters often seek the opposite of what they just had. But you've got, you've got candidates running statewide like uh, um, Ashley Swearingen, the mayor of Fresno, other large city Republican mayor. And wasn't there a guy who, who spent 600 bucks and almost made it David Evans. In the, into the final runoff? Well, that should, that's a whole discussion about is our state too big and can candidates even communicate adequately in a state this size about who they are? Uh, yeah, David, David Evans almost makes it largely, we would assume, because he had a, 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 a name that seemed uh, fairly Republican. I Anglo, suppose. is that what you're saying? And well, Anglo, <laughs> and he also had a ballot title uh, as a CPA. But, but, the, but, the, but the issue there is it tells you how much different the June election is versus the November yeah. election. So the, the, we had an overwhelmingly Republican uh, electorate this past um, June, and in, in November it's going to be vastly different. Um, when these, in the, the way these elections are working, um, you know, the June election doesn't reflect the two best candidates likely to go on to November oftentimes. And so um, we do have several places in California where we're going to have Democrat on, or Republican on Republican general election runoffs. And I guess that's okay. I, as a political consultant, I've never gotten to mail into Compton before. Last cycle, I was mailing into Compton and, you know, Oakland and San Francisco, which is actually interesting to learn the demographics of those areas, but that never happened under the closed primary system. Are, are, Mr. Rexroad, yes. are you uh, replicating what happened with Thad Cochran in Mississippi recently? Well, you know something? They're, they're, the, the issue and the reason I came to support the open primary system is I worked for a very conservative legislator in Los Angeles County for years, and I knew exactly how 
how many Republicans were in that district. And somebody asked me once, well, how many Democrats are in your district? I'm like, I don't know. And they're like, well, why don't you know? I'm like, they don't matter. And, and they're like, well, isn't that terrible? You have, and the number was, you know, 60, 70,000 people. I'm like, well, why don't you, isn't that terrible that they don't have a voice? I'm like, well, they don't. And so right now with this open primary system, you see candidates building coalitions all over the place and they're building them uniquely. And party label is part of it. And so Republicans wouldn't matter in San Francisco unless you're in a runoff between two candidates and you're looking to pick up 15% of the vote. That's, that's part of your formula to get to 50% plus one. Incidentally, Thad Cochran is the U.S. Senator incumbent from Mississippi who right. recently won a contested primary by going after a liberal Democratic, mostly African American voters. And uh, that, that was a national story for a little while. I am curious though, when it comes to coalition building, Rob, and also trying to actually uh, approximate the demographics of California, what, do, what does the Republican Party need to do in order to be more competitive in those districts that Matt's talking about? Well, they, they they need to know how many Democrats in their districts and why and why they, they matter. Do now. They do they do now. I mean, the new system has forced that. So, you know, politics responds to the marketplace. So when Matt was talking about that, you know, safe Republican seat, all that mattered was the Republican voters. Okay, but now we have this system where, like, for instance, here in Placer County, in full disclosure, I'm working with this Art Moore, who's running against Tom McClintock, Republican versus Republican. Well, now all the Democrats in the foothills in Placer, El Dorado. And, and the other counties down the foothills really matter in choosing their member of Congress. It's still going to be a Republican, still going to be a conservative Republican, but my candidate's out talking to all voters in the district, something Mr. McClintock has not done, because all he needed in the past was just the Republicans. This is healthy. So even, even if incumbents survive these type of challenges and only go through them every once in a while, they at least have to now be mindful of the fact that I need to have relationship coalition, understanding of being representative of everyone in my district, even if it is a Democrat in, in Compton or if it's a Republican in Placer County or Orange County, you're going to have to start being a little bit more mindful that I represent everybody that lives here. Does this mean that this is the return of the moderate Republican? Um, maybe, maybe not. I mean, I think that it's too early to tell in terms of the way the open primary and redistricting has worked still, even though we're going to be in our second cycle. But your question in terms of what Republicans need to do or, or what can they do, part of it is showing up. We don't have a single partisan office holder who's a Republican in any of the Bay Area counties right now. None. Not one. Not, not a member of Congress, not a member of the State Assembly, Assembly not a member of the State Senate. We need Republicans from, who are, who are good ambassadors, to be able to go into that area and give the Republican message on why it's important that that, that that voice be heard in the area. There are opportunities in Contra Costa County and in Santa Clara County, but we need to have people go and show up there. And if you're a legislator from Orange County, it's so easy just to fly back to John Wayne Airport. Some of them need to go hit San Jose and Oakland and fly out of there before they go back to be able to deliver that Republican message, which I think is very compelling to the large Vietnamese community in San Jose or the, um, the Asian population even in Alameda County. It's, there are opportunities there, but we got to have somebody go there and show up. So I have a tough question for you both <clears throat> related to that. In talking with a number of minority Republicans, mm -hmm. their comment has been that uh, traditionally <clears throat> the Republican Party has not been willing to actually put resources behind minority candidates for office and that there's a lot of lip service about going out and doing outreach, but in fact, it's pretty pathetic was the quote that I got mm -hmm. from one recent candidate, actually from the Contra Costa Alameda area. Mm -hmm. Well, but there is some, there's some desire. In the end, they're trying to win. I mean, that's what you're trying to do. And so some candidates say, well, hey, I don't, I don't, I, I you know, they needed to support me in San Francisco where I, instead of getting 11% of the vote, if they spend a million dollars, I can get 13% of the vote. That would be considered wasteful. But one of my clients, Bonnie Garcia, who's running down in Riverside County, has received enormous Republican Party support over the years in her three elections to the state assembly. And in the state Senate race, she's running against another Republican, so it's not Republican support, but she's not running away from that label. There are lots of examples of where the Republican Republican Party has supported good candidates who are running in districts where it fits and makes sense where they can win. But some of these districts in San Francisco, that's not a good expenditure of money. So in our final moments, if both of you were ultimately emperors of the California Republican Party, 
What's the one thing you'd do between now and the next election cycle in 2016 that you think would make a difference for the candidates? I'll start with you, Rob. Well, I would focus, much like what Matt just said, I would focus on going to communities and showing up. I'd be recruiting current electeds, like Matt just alluded to, to have to be strike teams to go in and talk, start talking about how we would deal with urban issues. And then I would focus voter education and registration on new immigrant communities. And it, it, this is a lot of hand-to-hand, -hand, door to door but start to change what are the impressions, I think misimpressions that have been left from the last uh, couple decades. Matt, you get the last word. We need to hold people accountable. In our party, if we have people who are not living up to our standards in terms of the way they behave in office, in terms of professionalism, we need to get rid of them and, and move on. And the party before has remained relatively silent. When people stub their toe in such a huge way where they're embarrassing the party, we need to part ways and go another way. Right now, we don't have the ability to be able to do that and truly hold people accountable, and that is how we would fix the Republican Party. Thank you both, gentlemen. We'll see what happens in November. Cool. Stay tuned. Well, that's our show. Thanks to our guests and thanks to you for watching Studio Sacramento. I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. At Five Star Bank, community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. All episodes of Studio Sacramento, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at kvie.org video.